Yo, yo, what is up? What is up? You are listening to the NBA Big Board Podcast. And today, if you like big boards, I have Sam Ferris, a.k.a. the intelligent one. He's going to share with us his latest big board. Stay tuned. This is the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, your daily NBA podcast. I am Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies.com. I've kind of made a name for myself as the guy that knows the international prospects, but my co-host, Sam Ferris, we don't call him the intelligent one for nothing. He provides his own intellectual insight. That's a little bit different from the most or the different from the consensus. Sam, what is what's, what's going on in your world today? I'm doing well. I mean, we're less than two weeks to the draft, so I think you were well aware, but been busy, did two or three um, guest appearances on other podcasts today, but there's always more to talk about when it comes to the NBA draft, especially with the clock ticking now at this point. Yeah, I had kind of chilled out on, on doing appearances, and then I opened it up last week, and I think I was doing like four or five of them a day. And it it's it can get tiring. Like there's times when I want to yeah. just uh, it's time for me to go take a nap or, or lay down after a podcast. And uh, on one hand, I enjoy it, but Knicks fans may be offended. I don't think I can do any more Knicks podcasts. <laughs> <That's>, uh-huh. <laughs> I've had so many requests, and I don't know if I can talk about the eleventh pick and how many different ways to talk about what the Knicks are going to do on different podcasts. So was your podcast like a Knicks related one or was it just a general one? Uh, It was a Kings and a Wizards one today. Okay. Uh, Those were the two that I did today. So a couple different ones. Yep. Yeah. Those are, those are a little different. I did a Kings one. I haven't done a Wizards one. Um, I have a few coming up, but I, I enjoy it. I mean, I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak on different podcasts and have people reach out to me. There was a time where, I didn't have anybody <laughs> that wanted to hear yeah. my insight on a podcast. It's just like the Knicks have such a huge, huge fan base. I've done a Knicks podcast that was based out of Australia. I've done some, I've done like spaces. I did Knicks fan TV. I just want to talk about some other prospects outside of number 11. All right, but let's, let's get right into today's episode. It is your big board. Are there any surprises? So I released a big board a few weeks ago, maybe like six weeks or so ago now. So I wouldn't say there have been like wholesale changes since then. And, you know, there probably shouldn't be since the season ends. Um, We do catch up on film. We do re-review film. We talk to different people. Uh, So there are going to be changes. And there have been a few changes today. A couple guys that have maybe moved up or down. Um, So maybe if we want to talk about the guys that have moved up for me uh, since the last podcast, or what do you think the best way to go about this would be? Actually, I want to talk about what you said, that even though there aren't any games and you're rewatching film, does this surprise Mm -hmm. you sometimes when you see a guy kind of skyrocket out of nowhere, like someone that, I mean, even though... I don't care too much about the consensus big boards. I kind of go by by my own thing. But you see a guy like, I mean, I just come out and say it, Dyson Daniels. He is yeah. all of the sudden, I, I've heard as high as five. I've heard that he is definitely a lottery pick. We just saw today that he he's invited to the green room. Are you surprised by his his rise? Yeah, it's interesting. Dyson Daniels would be the one. And then I would throw Jalen Williams also out of Santa Clara into that mix as well. So I'm not one that reacts that way because I've done a lot of my homework. You're the same way. Like this stuff isn't new for us. So, you know, those two guys specifically probably moved up a little due to the intel, but also due to the way they measured at the combine. So that was you know, a positive reinforcement to see them measure so well, you know, Dyson Daniels coming in at six foot eight, and then Jalen Williams uh, with the extremely long wingspan and just the good size at the off guard position. So yeah, like seeing them measure that well, for example, they moved up a few spots, uh, but Dyson Daniels has always been a late lottery guy. I was a person that was higher on him coming in, but I've tweeted this out recently. 
I think I'd be surprised if he ends up going below like nine or so now on draft night. And so that rise to me is maybe a little bit excessive. I still view him as the late lottery guy that I've kind of seen him like the whole process. And then Jalen Williams, the same thing. Like I already had him top 30 and yeah, I moved him up from like 30 to 25 based on his combine performance, but I can't quite get all the way to seeing him as like a late lottery guy. So I I have a better understanding for Jalen Williams because he played at the combine and he played very, very well. So I understand like, okay, he had some games after the season was over and, you know, like maybe scouts didn't really get a chance to watch him as much because he was in, you know, the West Coast Conference Why Daniels. I mean, the G League is supposed to be the most heavily scouted league in the world. And so I just kind of find it interesting. And and I've been talking to like a lot of people as far as just like Intel, getting different opinions, whether it's players, whether it's scouts or front office executives. And I had mentioned it to one person. I was asking him about, about his rise. And only one guy has had something to say. Negative is probably not the best word to use, but there was only one person that expressed some doubt as opposed to why he's moving up. And so this this particular comment was he can't see him moving that high up simply because earlier in the in the G League season and even through parts of the second half of the season, he struggled with ball pressure as far as bringing the ball up court if there was a defender that was really getting into him. And he made the comment, like, I don't know if there's a guy that I think is going to be my primary that someone can like kind of pressure him and he's going to have a hard time getting the ball up court. Is that something that, that you see or, or, or you saw in, the, in, the, in your film studies? Yeah, yeah, it is. And so that actually goes hand in hand with the comparison I've made. And I don't think they're going to be the exact same player, but similar points of impedance, as you could call them, is kind of the Lonzo ball role yeah. where – I like him as a linky defender, especially off the ball in a team context. And because of the size, he can guard down the lineup a little bit. So I like that. I like those aspects of his game. I like the scalability, um, but I don't see like the primary on ball guy. Not, he just wasn't that assertive at times. And he's not the guy that's going to get you into your offense a hundred percent of the time for an NBA team. The handle is like solid for being six foot eight. But again, not a guy that I'm turning the keys of my offense to in the NBA to generate offense every time down. I do view him as more of, you know, like that connector role is a word that's thrown around a lot. I think that's kind of where he'll fit in more in the NBA. And so, yeah, that's why I have him more in late lotto is the scalability, uh, the connecting skills he does well, but I don't see him being that heavy on ball guy in the NBA. Yeah, I, I agree. And I know you interviewed Jason Hart, and I spoke with him also at the Combine. He was adamant that he believes Dyson Daniels is a point guard. Yeah. Do you do you agree with that? Or obviously you, you just yeah, I mean, so you got some questions about it. I have some questions, but I, like, I think he can share ball handling duties. And uh, I think it's valuable that he can be that play next to another star because that's where his value comes in, in my opinion. And I just... I know you see somewhat similarly. I don't really see too many guys, if any, in this class that I think I really believe this guy is going to be a number one score or on ball creator for a playoff team. Uh, like, so I'm looking for scalable guys that I think can fit in well, be a really good number two or three. And so like, for me, that's a positive for him. And uh, to your point, I got to talk to Jason Hart. He loves him defensively. He said, um, really good, solid on-ball guy. And something that he's been working a lot with Dyson Daniels is the ability to get steals off ball, to be a little bit more of a gambler and get out in passing lanes, uh, which can help him get into transition. So he liked his on-ball ability, but wants to see that aggressiveness, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, that shark ability off the ball to get steals. Um, so I thought that was an interesting point that he brought up, but all around, I like the game. Whether you call him a point guard or not is kind of like the positional nomenclature. I don't know. I like more of his scalability to more so fit around a potential star. 
Yeah, it makes sense. And, and Hart had nothing but great things to say about Dyson Daniels on the court and off the court. And I actually had a chance to speak with him briefly at the combine and I could see how you can be really impressed or just wowed with him as, as, as a person. All right. We just talked to a whole segment on <laughs> Dyson Daniels and a little bit about Jalen Williams in the next segment. Let's get right to your big board. But first I want to talk about betonline.net and that is because it is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info for all of the latest sports developments, news and odds, including the NBA finals, NHL, Hockey Conference Finals, Major League Baseball, and of course, the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC down to boxing. And BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline is where the game starts. All right. My name is Rafael Barlow. Obviously, you know that. And I will be on the Ultimate Mock Draft, which starts on June 16th. It has over 50 locked on insiders, which nothing equals the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft. Or nobody can do it like the Locked On Crew, the Locked On NBA Big Board Draft Experts, which is myself, Sam, Leaf Tulane, Richard Stamen, and the Odyssey Insiders. The first pick is June 16th. Search the ultimate NBA mock draft and follow now so you do not miss a pick. All right. Got my guy on here, Sam Ferris, a.k.a. Mr. Draft Dummies, a.k.a. the intelligent one, even though that is somewhat of an oxymoron. (laughs) But all right, let's talk about some of your risers, your personal risers from your, your last big board. Yeah, so we'll start. Johnny Davis, to me, has been one. And I'll preface this by saying we kind of talked about this at the top of the show. A lot of people or a couple people have asked me, like, why are guys moving on your board at this point? And my my answer to that is nobody's really moving too much. I've done my homework on everybody. But as we finish up here, kind of what I'm trying to do is one last go around on the tape with some guys. But I'm also trying to kind of go back to my original thoughts to revisit my original notes because... Like a lot of things in life, the first thought or the first inclination you have about something, uh, like that's something you want to stick with. So I'm trying to go back to where I was because I think at times we have so much time to think about this, you can overthink stuff. So that's kind of something I've been thinking about recently. Johnny Davis was one of the guys that I was highest on compared to consensus coming into the year. Obviously had a fantastic season for Wisconsin leading them to a three seed. And so uh, just going back, revisiting my notes and thoughts originally, um, I think I did bump him down a little too much because of the ineffective and inefficient end of the season he had. And I do believe some of that was injury and just him wearing down due to carrying the load. And, And the stats on that, you know, the final seven games, the efficiency dropped off. He only slashed 33, 23, 86. And so that really hurt his efficiency. And so as I go back and rewatch his games from early in the year, revisit my early thoughts, I think he just has a little bit of a higher ceiling than people are giving him credit for. I agree. I I agree. And you said something that, that made sense was with this long process, sometimes you can just start to Overevaluate, and I've been open saying I did that a lot with the 2020 class because that was like the longest draft process yeah. ever. I think yeah. the draft was in what, like November or something like that. Yeah. So it was almost a full year. I mean, it was a full year to evaluate prospects, and I kind of started nitpicking. And it makes me think about how, you know, like for guys like us or even some NBA scouts, they start on prospects. At the minimum, you know, you may start in August preparing for the next class. And then maybe with some guys, you have two or three years to prepare. While it seems like general managers, they're so busy with the season that they kind of get on it late. And because they get on it late, I wonder, does that help or hurt them? Do they not overanalyze or are they just going with, like you said, your first inclination and and that's it? So that kind of stood out to me, what you said. And I just did an article on NBA Big Board, shameless plug here, but I did an article 
on swing skills. And I, I gave eight players and I start off with the top three, which is, you know, Ben Carroll, well, Chet Holmgren, Paolo Ben Carroll, and Jabari Smith. I, I listed some swing skills that I think can help them maximize their potential. And then I picked five guys that are outside of that top three that have, I, I feel like maybe one swing skill that could really help them maximize their full potential, whether it's going from all-star to all-NBA or high-level starter to all-star. And one of the things for me was, I mean, it's kind of an obvious one for people that have been paying attention all year, was Johnny Davis's outside shooting. Now, once I really started watching the film, I noticed, like, the catch-and-shoot is not bad. He can knock down catch-and-shoot jumpers. It's just the efficiency from three is where it, um, you know, the, the numbers are like 30%. But I think with a reduced role, he can be an effective outside shooter because you can't say he doesn't have touch. He's a tough shot maker. Yeah. He's one of the, you know, I, I'd say he's one of the best mid-range shooters in this class, mm -hmm. considering that he took a high degree of difficulty. Then if you believe that free throw percentage is an indicator of shooting touch, then you have to be optimistic that he can develop into a reliable three-point shooter. And I think if he has, if he's league average from three, it opens everything up because he can attack closeouts and and so on. So he was one of the, the, his outside shooting was one of the swing skills that I thought could really help him go from maybe high level starter to all-star. Now, do you have a swing skill outside of that for, for Johnny Davis? Yeah. Well, first of all, I totally agree with that. And it's actually funny because um, I tweeted sometime within the last few weeks, time is all blending together now, but you know, the fun hypothetical question that we like to ask ourselves pre-draft is like you know if you could guarantee any prospect you know a slightly above average three-point jumper down the line who would that most benefit and there's a lot of really good answers but i thought one to me that's kind of the under the radar good answer was johnny davis exactly to your point where i love the mid-range scoring i love the defense and I'll also add that he measured pretty well, in my opinion. I was a little bit worried that he'd measure close to 6'4", but his measurements are actually the exact same pretty much as Devin Booker. And so he's got that size to play the one or the two. It, like, he checks every box, but then at points this year, like you said, the three-point jumper wasn't consistent. And what did worry me was not only did he miss it, but he started hesitating and passing up shots when yeah. they weren't going in. And that that to me is the point where it becomes a little bit of a worry, uh, just the confidence leaving him because I love everything else about his game. I think he's got more creation off the bounce upside than a lot of people are giving him credit for. And so that to me is his swing skill. And if that hits, I think he's going to end up returning top seven value in this draft yeah and one thing that's interesting is that it is one of those things where i can have this conversation with you because i know you've done your homework and, and some other people i think if you tell that average person that hasn't spent a lot of time watching him and you say there were times where he was reluctant to shoot threes and if a person just looks at the raw numbers you'll say well he took like 3.9 or four attempts per game how are you a reluctant three-point shooter when you're shooting four per game? But that's why you can't just look at the, the basic yeah. numbers all the time. Yeah. All right, was there another player that has kind of moved up or down since your last mock or last big board? Um, so another guy that's moved up that I've always been higher on, but I kind of just bumped him up within the same tier is Jake LaRavia. My guy. Uh, I've talked about, <laughs> yeah. You're a fan. I'm a fan. A lot of people I talk to uh, are fans of his game. Um, my favorite kind of line to use with him is just there are very few guys that seemingly check like every analytical box like he does while also being six foot eight. And he's also still just 20 years old. And so another guy similar to Johnny Davis, where I think a lot of people talk about him, like his ceiling isn't that high. And that might be selling him a little short. I think there might be more ceiling there than we expect. But even if he doesn't hit that ceiling, if we're talking about a guy that's an above average shooter, that's a solid athlete that can dribble and pass at six foot eight, 
to me, like at, at minimum, we're talking about a guy that's going to be a ro- rotation player in the NBA for many years to come. I have so much more to say about Jake LaRavia, but I want to talk to the audience about Sakara, and then I'll, I'll definitely add my points on Jake LaRavia when we return. But Sakara helps you feel your best, and it starts with what you eat. It helps you live a healthy and balanced lifestyle while truly enjoying it. It has delicious, plant-rich, and transformational nutrition that builds a foundation for living in your best body. Now, it is summertime. It is getting hot, and everybody wants to work on their summer body, but it's also time to seek wellness, joy, and abundance in all areas of your life, and it starts with what you eat. With Sakara, you get nutrition-dense meals, snacks, and supplements that nourish your body without ever sacrificing taste or quality. True radiance. It starts on your plate. And Sakara is made with high quality organic ingredients and the plant rich transformational nutrition programs are expertly designed to deliver real results from reduced bloat, ease digestion to clear skin and boosted energy. And it helps you with your mood. So looking and feeling your best shouldn't mean deprivation. Instead, choose joy and abundance. Sakara's organic plant rich transformational nutrition programs are designed to help you cultivate body intelligence so you can nourish your body and experience the results that you want. Sakara is a wellness company anchored in foods as medicine on a mission to nourish your body through the power of plants. And right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash locked on 20, or you can enter the code locked on 20 at checkout. That is sakara, S-A-K-A-R-A.com slash locked on 20. And you get 20% off your first order. Sakar.com slash locked on 20. All right. You are listening to the NBA Big Board Podcast. I am Rafael Barlow here with Sam Ferris. And before we, well, when we left off, we were talking about Jake LaRavia. And maybe I'm a little biased. And I'm not afraid to admit sometimes I can be a little bit biased. But I've liked Jake LaRavia since the first time. I really took a dive into his film and stylistically, he's the one that I like. There are guys that, you know, you see the numbers, but for whatever reasons, you may not be a fan of their style of play or just aesthetically with Jake. He is the epitome of a connector, a guy that I feel like you can put on the court next to any player in any system. And I think he'll thrive. So I was always a fan, but then once I had a chance to meet him and spend some time with him and just see his work ethic up close and personal, I was all in. I think he's a first round pick. I think teams would be making a monumental mistake if he falls out of the first round, but I don't really see that happening. And one of the things about Jake that it it goes back to your point where people talk about him not having like this high ceiling or high upside, it just shows me that if you are like super athletic and you're raw, then upside is usually, you know, (laughs) it's usually the next thing they say. If you are skilled and you are advanced, then it's like, you don't have upside. And then I think with Jake, He's 20. I don't know where the mistake came from, but for the most of the season, he was his age was listed wrong at 22 years old. So once you factor in that he's 20, a 20 year old junior, then <laughs> how could you say that he doesn't have much upside? And then another thing about Jake that really should throw people off in a sense is there's like this stereotype that he's not a good defender. Well, if people watch the film, you see he's a good defender. And then at the combine, he tested, I want to say it was like, I don't know if it was the, one of the shuttle drills. He finished third out of everybody in the combine. So he can move his feet. Now, no, he's not like crazy, explosive, bouncy. But I think at this point, we've seen so many guys that were athletic get drafted over guys that were skilled and teams end up like, regretting it and I think with Jake you know shot 38 percent from three and 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 I want to get your thought on this Mm -hmm. he only took I want to say like two a little under three attempts per game if I'm not mistaken from three Mm -hmm. if Jake shot with volume if he attempted four or five three-point attempts per game and let's say the percentage went down to 37 as opposed to 38 would he be a lottery pick 
on most boards? I think you'd at least have to consider it more, but I, I don't know why people aren't. I guess the obvious answer is he started his career at Iowa State, right? And Indiana, Indiana State. Thought, Indiana State, yep. sorry. Um, and and so because he's a third year player, some people thought he was older, like you said, his uh, reported to be 22, but then we found out he's 20 and that age difference is huge. That's a big deal. He's so young for here. Uh, the grade that he was playing in and so like I want to hit on your point too about like the athleticism and what constitutes upside just real quick because you know athleticism versus functional athleticism and you you watch the film and and also look at the numbers and you find out that he actually is a really good functional athlete I mean 32 dunks last year career 3.6 block rate 2.4 steal rate like he does everything well in the numbers that indicate that the athleticism is there. And if you actually watch the film or see him work out like you have, or even see him test at the combine, like, you know, he's actually a really solid to even good functional athlete. And then combine that with the fact that he's six foot eight and can do all this uh, on the perimeter skill wise. To me, it's like, he's a little bit hiding in plain sight is a really impressive prospect. <laughs> I love that. Hiding in plain sight. And he really didn't get the love that he deserved. I mean, and Alondis Williams had a great season. Without a doubt, I don't want to take anything from Alondis, but I feel like Alondis really overshadowed Jake in a sense. But I do believe that Jake will be drafted ahead of Alondis. And when I when I watched him work out, I spent three days there. Like I said, I was impressed with the with the work ethic. I mean, he his days were long. It was Long for me, just observing, got up in the morning, worked out. He did and kind of workouts on the track. Not saying that other guys aren't doing this, but the the night shooting was not just your basic, all right, we worked out all day. The second half of the day at night, we're just going to come in and shoot some basic set shots. He was really like getting after it. And even though some of the drills may not be related to his role, the fact that he was working on situations where if he has the ball late in the shot clock, he's going to be able to, you know, he's working on moves that he would do to, um, you know, create his own offense. So again, I, I'm high on Aravia. I think he's a first round pick. Now, where do you have him going on your, on your last mock? Um, so on my personal big board, again, not necessary. It's not a mock draft, but my personal rankings of these, these prospects, uh, I have him at 17 right now. So like okay. middle of the first round, Granted, it's like I've got a tier from like 17 to 25 where it's pretty close within tiers, but I've got him towards the top of that tier just because I'm a little bit more comfortable. Uh, me, I know what I'm getting with him, and I still think he has that underrated ceiling. And so those things combined are the reasons why I've, I've moved him up four or five spots as I've gone back and revisited notes, film, and stats. Uh, so still within the same tier, but I moved him up to the top of the tier. So all the way up at 17. And I know there's a few other people like you included that also view him as first round picks. And I think by the time the draft happens, I think he will end up being a first round pick. Yeah. And if you look at the teams in that range, you can go down the list and say he fits in Minnesota. Okay. He fits in San Antonio. They started McDermott at the four. You look at Denver. He can pass, spaces the floor. He's a good fit there. You go to Philly, they need shooting. You know, you can play him with Embiid. You can go down the line and say he is a good fit for a bunch of these teams. And um, my last point about Jake was when I was at the combine, I met with some people from Cerebro Sports. And uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Cerebro Sports. Um, it's, um, I mean, the best way I can describe it is this crazy crazy analytical data that has these value systems when they're explaining it to me it felt like I was taking calculus I couldn't <laughs> I wasn't smart enough to fully understand what they were saying so and they had all this data from back to like LeBron James in high school and it just kind of compares how guys for uh, how they perform based off of all these different metrics and so they would ask me questions like, who was the best player in this class? Or who do you think was this? And, and the numbers matched up with, with basically like what I would say, like they would ask me, who was the best shooter in, I don't know, whatever year. So they said that 
you know, pull up any metric you want and it, it can be fairly accurate. So they had all these different metrics you can do. And Jake tested out or he listed as the best connector in this class, which really sold me on on their data, because if you would have asked me who I thought was the best connector, I would have said Jake and, and, the, and the data matched it. And they didn't even know I, I knew Jake. So shout out to the people at Cerebral Sports. But man, that wraps it up for this episode. Once again, I, I always enjoy chatting basketball with you. We are two weeks away. Well, when this episode air will be a little under two weeks away. I'm looking forward to it. And is it just me? Are you ready to kind of move on from this draft cycle and get on to 2023? I mean, it's yeah, it's always fun to <laughs> finalize it for us that follow the draft. I mean, the day of the draft is like my Christmas almost. It's really fun to just finalize, sit down, watch, see where these guys go. So I am ready for the draft because I'm always very excited about it. Yeah, I'm ready for the draft. And then I'm ready for summer league. And yep. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to taking a deep dive on guys from 2023 and just kind of catching up on some of like the, the U S national team. I think like the under 18 team is playing and just catching up on that film. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. But before I go, I want the audience to, first of all, I want to thank you for making the NBA big board podcast, your first listen of the day, but I want you to check out the locked on NBA podcast. They are covering the NBA finals. They have expert analysis that will also affect all 30 teams. They've been covering the playoffs since the first jump ball of the playing tournament, and they will be there until the last buzzer of the NBA finals, which now with everything going on now, I feel like if Boston wins, Draymond Green is going to get all the blame for the Warriors losing. But if the Warriors win, oh my gosh. I, I, could you imagine... What the Draymond Green podcast is going to sound like if he wins his fourth <laughs> ring. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Stephen A. Smith and all the people that have had things to say, it's going to be an entertaining week of uh, of social media. All right. Well, that wraps it up. Thank you so much. I'm Rafael Barlow. He is Sam Ferris. And we are out.